to welcome you all to the opening of Special Collections' new exhibit, and also to introduce, introduce today's speaker, Professor Kent B. Jackson. Kent Jackson is a professor of ancient scripture at Brigham Young University. He has a BA in ancient studies from BYU, an MA and PhD degrees in biblical and ancient Near Eastern studies from the University of Michigan. He joined the BYU faculty in 1980. His research interests include Latter-day Saint scripture, doctrine, and history, with emphasis on the intersection of Mormonism and the Bible. He has authored or edited Joseph Smith's Commentary on the Bible, Joseph Smith's New Translation of the Bible Original Manuscripts, and the Book of Moses and the Joseph Smith Translation Manuscripts. He was the chair of BYU's February 2011 symposium commemorating the 400th anniversary of the King James translation of the Bible. Many of you may have joined us for that. And he is the editor of the King James Bible and the Restoration, which will be released next month, October 2011. Professor Jackson is a former associate dean of religion and former associate director of the BYU Jerusalem Center for Near Eastern Studies. And now for Professor Jackson. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here today. This is a, this is a happy occasion to officially open the um, lovely display of the King James Bible uh, here in L. Tom Perry Special Collections, and I'm delighted that, uh, and honored that I would be requested to speak to you today. Uh, all over the world this year, there are commemorations for the 400th anniversary of the King James translation of the Bible. So this is one of many such events that have taken place during the year 2011. I noticed when, the, when I received a flyer in my mailbox and when I saw posters on the campus, as you can see behind me on the board, um, I pay attention to things like the uh, size of type. I noticed that my name is in a larger type font than that of the Bible, or King James, or Harold B. Lee. Uh, I was not the designer of this piece of art, but it is a good introduction for some of the things that we are going to see in the images I'm going to show you about how different messages have been sent through the history of the er early English Bibles. Uh, the title is a cast of characters, and somebody asked me yesterday, now, what do you mean by characters? Do you mean characters? or characters. Well, cast of characters is the uh, sheet you usually see that tells you who the actors are in, in a play or a movie or something like that. But characters also means characters. And I suspect that in any enterprise, including the creation of the English Bible, you're going to have characters and characters. And so today, I think it's good for us to take the time to talk about some of those characters who uh, created the Bible for us uh, over the long process by which the Bible came into existence that we still use today. And to begin with, we certainly have to pay attention to the authors of the Bible. They are our first and perhaps most important characters. And so we have people like uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I could have included others. I deliberately didn't include Paul, who doesn't read very well at all in the King James translation. And I don't know if that's King James's fault or William Tyndale's fault or more likely Paul's fault. Um, but in any case, when you look at a beautiful 
passage from the scriptures, don't think first of the translator. Think first of who the original author was. John Wycliffe. From the fifth century, Western Europe's Bible was the Latin Vulgate. Few people could read it, only the academics and some of the priests. Being able to read the Bible was not something normal people were expected to do. But the original Bible was not in Latin. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew, the language of ancient Israelites, and New Testament was written in Greek, the language of most early Christians. When changes in culture and population took place, the Bible was translated so more people could read it. Jews in the third and second centuries BC translated the Old Testament into Greek, which by then was the only language that many Jews knew. When Latin became the primary language of a large number of Christians, the scriptures were translated into that language. The Latin translator in the fifth century was St. Jerome. <clears throat> we call his translation the Vulgate because it was the vulgar, that is common translation, uh, a common language of ordinary people. Literate Christians could read it. Indeed, putting the scriptures into the language of ordinary people through all those centuries was the desired thing to do. But in the centuries after the Bible's translation into Latin, things changed. Latin ceased to be a spoken language, at least among ordinary people. <clears throat> it was kept alive by scholars and priests for the use of the church and the academy, and thus what had once been the language of the common people was eventually the language of only the elites. And unlike in earlier centuries, when the Bible was translated to meet the changing needs of common people, that process was not continued. The Vulgate remained the Bible of the church, but now is no longer accessible to ordinary people because they couldn't read it, and it was controlled by the few who could. Then the medieval church developed the notion that God intended the Bible to be un inaccessible to common people. The fact that it was foreign and unapproachable became a good thing. And finally, to complete the process, the idea became established that the Latin translation was more authoritative than the original texts in the original languages. John Wycliffe was a reformer before there was a reformation. He became well known in England for contending that the church had no authority in temporal matters which should be left to the state. As in the days of the apostles, the church should be poor and outside of politics. This view made him popular with the monarchy and the aristocracy, but it had the opposite effect with the pope and the wealthy bishops and mon monastic orders. Wycliffe argued his point from the Bible. He believed that the Bible was the authority on such matters and that it showed no precedence for how the church was conducting its affairs in his time. And because the Bible was God's word and was essential for church, state, and everyday life, why not translate it into the language of regular people so they can be aware of its content? With that in mind, Wycliffe was the originator, facilitator, organizer, and one of the translators of the Bible that bears his name. By the time of his death, handwritten copies of the Wycliffe Bible were being circulated copied and distributed throughout England. The Wycliffe translation was too literal, a mostly word-for-word -word rendering from the Latin, not from Hebrew and Greek, but it was a Bible in the, were in the English language and the beginning of a popular movement to get the word of God into the spoken tongue of ordinary people. Consider for a moment how laborious it must have been to hand copy your neighbor's Bible so that you could have your own copy of the Bible. All of this took place before the invention of the printing press. Wycliffe had friends in his own time and later, but the authorities of the church were not among them. About half a century after his death, his bones were exhumed and burned and his ashes were ceremonially scattered in a river. A lot of people got burned alive. You had to be really undesirable, apparently, to be have your bones dug up 
and then burned. Um, over the centuries, Wycliffe's Bible continued to be copied and circulated. Its influence became great not because the translation was good, it wasn't, but because it brought the Bible out of the exclusive control of the church and into the hands of the people. It was a movement whose time had come, but it came at a cost. William Tyndale, translator. William Tyndale is the single most important person in the history of the English Bible. He was not only the first to translate the Bible into English from Greek and Hebrew, but he also is the author, if we can use that kind of language, of the King James translation. Indeed, the Bible we use today is Tyndale's Bible. He wrote most of the original. Today's Bible is a revised, refined, and modernized edition of Tyndale's translation of 90 years before 1611. At its heart, and in the vast majority of its language, we can see the genius of William Tyndale. Tyndale was influenced by the legacy of Wycliffe and his successors. By Tyndale's time, Wycliffe's Bible had been banned, but it was still being copied and circulated on the underground. Translating the Bible had become a capital crime. None of that deterred Tyndale, who in violation of the law and in constant danger of imprisonment and death, translated and published parts of the Bible into English. Tyndale, like Wycliffe and other reformers of his own time, believed that the Bible should be in the language of the people and available to believers individually. Yet the church's hold on the Bible was stronger than ever and the authority of the Latin Vulgate was supreme. Tyndale knew that the original Hebrew and Greek texts, in the words of the ancient prophets and apostles themselves, were more authoritative than any tra translation can be. And he knew that the manuscripts in those languages that were closest to the writer's originals should be the source from which translations should come. Thus, unlike Wycliffe's translation from the Vulgate, Tyndale set out to translate from the earliest sources, using editions of the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament that only recently had appeared in print, he undertook the first English translation of the Bible from its original languages. He succeeded wonderfully. In addition to being a courageous reformer and advocate of religious freedom, Tyndale was also a master linguist and wordsmith. His goal was to make the Bible so accessible that every plowboy in England could own and read a copy of it and understand it. To that end, the New Testament and the Old Testament sections he translated and published were small, portable, and relatively inexpensive. His goal was not to produce monuments, but to produce something that could get the word of the of God into the hands of people. His translation is characterized by what Nephi called plainness. It is in clear and simple English, the language of middle class people of his time, and deliberately free of the elegant and affected literary trappings of the monarchy and the church. It is, as one scholar has said, accessible, useful, clarifying, less interested in the grandeur of its music than in the light it brings, end quote. Tyndale's choice of words has endured. Research by our colleague Royal Skousen has shown that over 75% of the King James Old Testament of the sections Tyndale translated come from Tyndale, as well as over 80% of the King James New Testament. Tyndale had another advantage over Wycliffe. In the middle of the previous century, Johannes Gutenberg had invented movable type and the printing press. The technology of printing had, had arrived just in time for the translation of the Bible into vernacular languages. Tyndale translated and published the New Testament in two editions and Genesis to Deuteronomy in two editions and Jonah. He also translated Joshua to Second Chronicles, which were published after his lifetime. Before he could translate more, however, he was captured, imprisoned, strangled to death, and burned at the stake for his heresy. 
According to his contemporary John Fox, Tyndale's last words were, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Apparently, the Lord did open the King of England's eyes. Our next character, Miles Coverdale, bishop, reformer, and Bible translator. In 1535, Miles Coverdale uh, published the first ever translation, printed translation of the Bible into the English language of the complete Bible. Uh, looking at the title page here, it says, Biblia, the Bible, that is, the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testament. And then faithfully and truly translated out of the Deutsch, which means Deutsch, German, and Latin into English. Now, Coverdale did not know Hebrew or Greek. And so what he did for his 1535 translation, which, as you can see from the date, came off the press before... Tyndale's death, Tyndale was on the continent, may not have even known of the printing of this. Um, what, what Coverdale did is that he took Tyndale's published Old Testament sections and Tyndale's New Testament, and then Coverdale himself translated um, from Greek and Latin texts into English, and by that means put together, put together a whole English Bible. And so Tyndale moves on then into, Tyndale's translation then moves on into the next Bible to come out, that is the Coverdale Bible of 1535. Now the thing that made Coverdale's Bible translation and publication possible was our next character, King Henry VIII. Henry VIII was kind of, uh, uh, history kind of dragged Henry VIII reluctantly into the creation of the English Bible. In his early years, Henry VIII received a, a commendation from the Pope for being a defender of the faith. In his latter years, for political and social reasons, Henry found it expedient to leave the Roman Catholic Church and establish what we call the Church of England <coughs> with himself, the king, as the head of the church. Part of this process, as, as part of this process, he accepted the pleadings of Miles Coverdale and then two others to allow for the publication in English uh, of the complete Bible. So Henry VIII becomes an important part of the process. And in Coverdale's Bible, um, we can, if, if you look at the title page, you can see biblical scenes surrounding the text in the middle of the page, but what do we see at the bottom? We see an image of the king, and to his right, he is passing out a copy of the Bible to the bishops that they in turn can share with the church. And so this turns out to be the first of several such images in printed English Bibles that puts the king, puts the English monarch into the story of being part of the process of taking the Bible from the heavens and dispensing it to people on earth. John Rogers. Two years after Coverdale's Bible came out, a man by the name of John Rogers in 1537 published his own copy of the English Bible. Rogers' text was Again, William Tyndale's Old Testament. Tyndale published about half the Old Testament, or yeah, translated about half the Old Testament. So Thomas Rogers' Bible was Tyndale's half of the Old Testament, Tyndale's New Testament, and then he edited Coverdale's translation and included it in his. Now, Rogers was a step ahead of Coverdale because Rogers, who was a close friend of William Tyndale's, had a big chunk of the Bible, namely from Joshua through Second Chronicles, that Tyndale had translated but had not yet published. And so that part of Tyndale's translation now finds its way into an English Bible for the first time. You probably can't read the really small print there 
but what that tells us in the outlined area that th is that this new Bible was truly and purely translated into English by Thomas Matthew. For political reasons, Rogers did not want to use his name, nor could he use William Tyndale's name, in it. and so he made up uh, out of the names of two apostles in the New Testament, he simply made up a name for, to serve as a pseudonym for the publication of this Bible. Now, I began my presentation talking about the size of type on, on things. Notice carefully, we got the Bible, we got the date, but what do we have in bigger type than anything else? Set forth with the king's most gracious license. And so John Rogers here wants to make sure in bigger type than even the word Bible that his readers know that he does not want to get burned at the stake like Tyndale, but that he is printing this Bible with the license of King Henry VIII. Here's another edition. This one is a 15... 51 <coughs> printing of the same translation of the Bible, and you can see there at the bottom of the page the same image that Miles Coverdale used in his printing of the Bible to show the king dispensing the written word. All of the rest of the images on this page are of biblical scenes, and the king has graduated to that group. The next Bible to come out in English two years later was the Great Bible. Miles Coverdale and others took, the Matthew, took Matthew's Bible, the Thomas Rogers translation, and uh, incorporated that into a new translation called the Great Bible. Um, this one, published in 1539, uh, shows again a progression of Tyndale and then revised other sections in order to make the text and the translation better and better. But still, the translators were using recycled Coverdale Bible material that was translated out of German and Latin and not out of the original languages. Now, at the top of the page, what do we have? In fact, look at the whole title page and what do we have? No biblical scenes at all, strictly scenes that show that, that approach the, that address the political circumstances with regard to the coming of the Bible. King Henry VIII on the top, passing to his right um, a copy of the Bible to the leaders of the church. The next level down, you see the bishops passing it out to the priests. And then on the king's left, we have him passing copies of the Bible to the, um, to the political leaders, uh, passing it down, and down at the bottom, we have nothing but very happy peasants, all with those uh, balloons coming out of their mouths saying in good Latin, vivat rex, God save the king. And so the title page of this Bible, which was printed with endorsement from the king, becomes a political statement and gone are the images of biblical figures on the title page. Noticed in the text, the Bible in English of the largest and greatest volume. This was called the Great Bible because it was the largest and greatest Bible ever printed. And then notice the next section of the text. This is the little thing in the middle of the title page. Octorized and appointed by the commandment of our most redoubted prince and sovereign lord, King Henry VIII, supreme head of this his church and realm of England, to be frequented and used in every church within this his said realm. Queen Mary I. Uh, Mary Tudor would not be pleased um, if she knew that I was listing her among the characters who was responsible for bringing forth the King James translation of the Bible. She was a daughter of King Henry VIII. King Henry VIII was born a Catholic 
died a Protestant. He was succeeded by his son, Edward VI, who, lived, who ruled for only a very short time, who was a Protestant. And then they brought in Mary, another daughter of King Henry, to rule as Queen of England. She was an unprotestantized, very firm um, Catholic. And during her very short reign, which was unhappy both for her and for everyone else, the growing Protestant movement fell on very, very hard times. During her five-year reign, almost 300 Protestant leaders were burned at the stake. The first of these was John Rogers, the close friend of William Tyndale, who had pre produced the Thomas Matthew Bible. Many British Protestant leaders, rather than converting, which is what most of the British bishops did, converted back to Catholicism, uh, many Protestant leaders simply decided to flee. And so they moved to the continent and went to the town of Geneva. Now, what was going on in Geneva in the 1550s? In the 1550s, Geneva was the intellectual hub of Protestantism in Europe. Under the direction of uh, uh, John Calvin and Theodore Beza primarily, uh, Geneva had become the intellectual nerve center for all of Protestantism with an enormous amount of productivity. The English Protestant exiles who fled from Queen Mary moved there and took up their Protestant cause in exile under the direction of their own people and the overall direction of Calvin, who was more or less the head of state. One of these was William Whittingham, a great reformer and translator. This man is made a greater contribution to the King James translation than any of the King James translators. He, tra he published in 1557, uh, what's called the Geneva New Testament. It was a fresh, uh, it was a fresh new printing in clear type, in easy language of the, of the New Testament. Notice what he says, it, it was conferred diligently with the Greek and best approved translations. What that means is that he took Tyndale's translation of fresh and modernized it and improved upon it based on better Greek manuscripts that were available and with the use of translations from other languages to produce what was the best translation of the New Testament from Greek into English that had ever appeared in print. You'll notice also on the title page that he tells us that this Bible ha includes arguments as well before the chapters as for every book and epistle, also diversities of readings and most profitable annotations of all hard places. In other words, Whittingham's New Testament was packed full of explanatory notes. Our next characters, people whose names you may not have ever heard before right now, any one of whom made enormous contributions to our King James Bible today. Anthony Gilby, Christopher Goodman, Thomas Sampson, there may be others whom we don't even know. These were the people who worked with William Whittingham uh, three years after the publication of his New Testament in Geneva to produce the whole Geneva Bible. Notice, <coughs> so 1560 is our year now the whole Bible gets translated into English under the direction of Whittingham and then these other people and perhaps some others. We don't know the story because we don't have records of who did what. Translated according to the Hebrew and Greek and conferred with the best translations in diverse languages. Now, what does that mean? It means that they took Tyndale's Pentateuch, Genesis through Deuteronomy, Tyndale's historical books, Tyndale had also published Jonah separately, a very short book, and Tyndale's New Testament. So the Geneva Bible included all of this from Tyndale, the whole New Testament and half of the Old Testament, 
and they added to it for the first time ever um, a translation of the Bible into English, of the Old Testament into English, out of Hebrew instead of Latin. And so they included the writings, uh, Psalms, Proverbs, and so forth, and they included the prophetic books. <coughs> and Gilby and the other people whose names you saw there were the great scholars who put together that translation of half of the Old Testament that we still have today in the King James translation of the Bible. Now, the King James translation, we'll look at way ahead here for a moment, but the King James translation is simply the latest in a series of reproductions and refinements of William Tyndale's work. But Tyndale didn't publish the second half, didn't translate the second half of the Old Testament. The Geneva translators did. And notice the beauty of this language and see if this sounds familiar. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to rest in green pastures and leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul and leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I should walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou dost prepare a table before me in the sight of mine adversaries. Thou dost anoint mine head with oil, my cup runneth over. Doubtless, kindness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall remain a long season in the house of the Lord. The King James translators wisely took virtually all of that and put it into the King James translation. Aside from, in that passage I just read you, aside from a few uh, punctuation changes and just a few other words, we still today have the translation that was done by these people whose names you, you've never heard before. Here's another one. It shall be in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be prepared in the tops of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, come and let us go up unto the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths for the law shall go forth out of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and rebuke many people Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn to fight any more. The producers of the Geneva Bible shared Tyndale's vision of making the Bible accessible to ordinary people. And like Tyndale, they wanted to help Christians read the Bible in the privacy of their homes. To that end, their Bible included maps, illustrations, cross-references, numerous study helps, and as we see on the title page here, most profitable annotations upon all the hard places in the form of copious explanatory notes that were presented in the margins. Take a look at this page from the first of the book of Revelation. The Geneva Bible was a self-contained library, not only for personal scripture study, but also for instructions in how to live the life of a faithful Christian. And because of its popularity, its marginal commentary became one of the most widely read works in the English language. The Geneva Bible was what we now call a study Bible, and it enabled readers to drink deeply from the words of the prophets and apostles without the mediation of priests or the church, but with commentary on the scriptures by some of the greatest thinkers in Protestant Christianity. More than any other Bible in English, the Geneva Bible liberated the word of God from its medieval past and placed it in the hands of hundreds of thousands of readers. It was also the Bible of Shakespeare and his contemporaries and was an important foundation of modern English. When England became permanently Protestant, the Geneva Bible and its translators were able to leave their exile on the continent and the Geneva Bible was soon printed in England and became the English Bible of choice. The Geneva Bible was the most popular and widespread Bible in English for about 70 years, but it was not popular with the authorities. Why not? It was produced outside the control of the Crown and the Church of England, 
and the marginal notes contained material that displeased both. An authorized version was needed to replace it. The Bishop's Bible, first published in 1568, was, preserved, was prepared by conservative Anglican bishops under the direction of Matthew Parker, Archbishop of Canterbury. Parker and his bishops were not friends of the Geneva exiles and the Puritan, and the, and the Puritan movement's growing independence from the Church of England, nor were they altogether comfortable with the idea of giving ordinary people free access to the Word of God. Thus, they produced a translation of the Bible to compete with the Bishop's Bible, or with the Geneva Bible. It was farther removed from the common language of the people than the Geneva Bible was. In its vocabulary and sentence structure, it was a throwback to earlier times with an increase of less familiar Latin-based words and much Latin-based word order. As David Daniel has written, the Bishop's Bible, quote, was and is not loved. Where it reprints Geneva, it is acceptable but most of the original work is incompetent, both in its scholarship and in its verbosity. The Bishop's Bible was intended to be used in churches, and to that end, its large, heavy volumes were chained to pulpits all over England. It lacked all the marginal notes that the bishops found offensive in the Geneva Bible, with the desired effect that people would need to get their explanations from church. Predictably, people found the Bishop's Bible unappealing, bought few copies of it, and continued to purchase the Geneva Bible instead. It soon became apparent to officers of the church that, the, that a better authorized version was needed. Now, notice the title pages of these two editions of the Bishop's Bible, first edition 1568, another edition in 1569, totally gone. Queen Elizabeth I is the monarch now. Totally gone are any biblical stories, biblical pictures. Everything you see on those pages is meant to um, uh, win favors or aggrandize or however you want to interpret that, the monarchy and the throne. King James I. King James I uh, is not famous for much in English history except for the fame of creating, of instigating, and seeing to the creation of the King James Bible. And that was a fame that came long after his lifetime. In his own time, he was not known as a particularly good or memorable king. But he was a pretty good amateur Bible scholar, and so he was actually pretty well up to date with a lot of the theological issues regarding translations. He was no friend of the Puritans, uh, the people who had been to Geneva and others, and he favored the conservative bishops, and he really disliked the Geneva Bible, not because the of the biblical text, but, it, but because he found notes in its margins that said things like, it's, obey, it's okay to disobey the king on occasion. King James believed in the divine calling of kings, and uh, that struck a sensitive uh, note in him. But he surprised everyone when he agreed to a new translation of the Bible. The King James translation then, published in 1611, was motivated as much as anything else by the politics of the day, including the continuing popularity of the Geneva Bible. Geneva was popular with the nonconformist Puritans, whose loyalty to the monarchy and the church was under suspicion. Its abundant marginal notes reflected independence from both the church and the crown, and in some places reflected ideas that the king and his advisors found bothersome. For one thing, the marginal notes um, in the King James Bible were an effort toward democracy. I don't need the monarchy. I don't need a priest. I can read the Bible, and I can read commentary on it on my own. So in, the, in a sense, the, bishops, the, the Geneva Bible was a seditious document. And the other problem with it was it was hugely popular. It was a very, very fine translation. 
and English people loved it. The decision was made to undertake a new translation free of the undesirable influences and under the careful watch of authorities. A large committee of about 50 men was organized into six smaller working groups and the various parts of the Bible were divided among them. Among the translators were the best Hebrew and Greek scholars in Britain. They were an amazing, learned, and talented group. And I'm only going to mention three of them. John Reynolds. John Reynolds, like the other translators, extraordinary, learned, smart, great control of ancient languages. He was a Puritan and was considered a moderate. It was he who suggested to King James that a new translation be undertaken. He was appointed to be one of the translators that worked on the prophetic books, and he died before the project was completed. Richard Bancroft. Richard Bancroft, the Archbishop of Canterbury, was appointed by King James to oversee the new translation, which he did until his death a year before the new Bible was printed. Now, notice, the Geneva translation, spontaneous translation by reformers done away from the authorities. King James translation, under the direction of the king, number two guy in the kingdom for religious matters, Archbishop of Canterbury is in charge of it. Like the others involved in the translation, Bancroft was highly educated and deeply tied into the church. Of the 50 or so men involved in the preparation of the King James Bible, all but one were either priests or bishops of the Church of England. Unlike the Geneva Bible, the King James translation was to be an in-house project under careful control from the highest authorities. Bancroft is remembered historically for his oversight of the KJV, but his greatest fame comes because as a priest, bishop, and archbishop, he was one of the foremost opponents of the Puritans. In fact, he was the chief persecutor of the nonconformists that we call the pilgrims who came to America. It is one of the interesting ironies of history that we celebrate both the King James Bible and the pilgrims who fled to America in 1620 to escape persecution from King James, Richard Bancroft, and the bishops who brought about the King James Bible. Bancroft, at the king's instructions, created a list of 15 rules that would govern King James's translation. Most were procedural, but the most important for the Bible are these. Start with the Bishop's Bible. The new translation would be an edit of the Bishop's Bible. That's rule number one. Rule number six, no margin marginal notes allowed except to explain Hebrew and Greek words and for cross-references. Number 14, use other translations where they agree better with the Hebrew and Greek text than does the Bishop's Bible. And all of the English Bibles that we've discussed so far were on the list that they could use. Because the instructions were to make a revision of the Bishop's Bible, each member of the committee was given a fresh, unbound copy or part of a copy to work from. They also had before them the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament, as well as all of the earlier translations. Those who worked on the KJV can thus be viewed more as editors than as translators, because that was the nature of their assignments. But this takes nothing away from their monumental accomplishment. They worked patiently through all parts of the Bible, scrutinizing every passage. They selected the words they felt best represented the intent of the Hebrew and Greek originals, often drawing words directly out of the earlier English translations. Thus, the Tyndale Bible and all of the translations that derived from it became the drafts for the KJV, the final product of almost 90 years of work to create the English Bible. The outcome was the most consistent and carefully produced of all the English Bibles to that date. In general, their work succeeded best when they followed the original languages in Geneva, and hence Tyndale. It succeeded least when they remained true to their instructions to follow the Bishop's Bible. Awkward passages from the Bishop's Bible survive in the KJV even today, as in this example from Matthew chapter 6, verse 34 a totally unintelligible 
statement coming from the mouth of Jesus, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. If King James's translators had used Tyndale as their beginning text instead of the Geneva Bible, maybe we would have this, the day present hath ever enough of its own trouble, or Geneva, the day hath enough with its own grief. But in other instances, such as the beautiful passage from Psalms and the one from Isaiah chapter uh, 2 that I read earlier, the translators wisely abandoned the bishop's Bible and followed Geneva instead, often even improving upon Geneva's wording. On the whole, the language of the King James translation is strongest in the Gospels, where it is most firmly based on the genius of William Tyndale. Miles Smith. When the King James Bible was published in 1611, it included an 11-page small print introduction called The Translators to the Reader. It was written by Miles Smith, one of the translators. In an extraordinary display of fine prose and fine arguments, Smith made the translator's case for the necessity of publishing the Bible in the contemporary language of its readers. He expressed the intent of the King James Bible as follows. We never thought from the beginning that we should need to make a new translation. That is, we weren't making a new translation, that wasn't our intent, nor yet to make of a bad one a good one, but to make a good one better, or out of many good ones, one principal good one. That was their objective. Notwithstanding Bancroft's rule number one to start with the Bishop's Bible, it appears that the good translation that the King James scholars wanted to make better was the Geneva Bible, not the Bishop's Bible. Interestingly, the introduction, frequent quotations from scripture come not from its own King James translation, but from the Geneva instead. This is so strange. The introduction to the KJV, when it quotes scripture, quotes the Geneva Bible instead of their own new translation. And sadly, although the introduction makes a point of telling readers that the translation is built on the work of others, it never mentions its debt to William Tyndale, who is still viewed with suspicion by some. The king and the bishops who produced the King James Version were themselves less enthusiastic than Tyndale and the Geneva translators about turning the Bible over to lay readers. This is reflected in interesting ways. Whereas the first Geneva title page had an illustration of Moses parting the Red Sea inviting readers into the promised land of reading the Bible in their own language, the King James title page depicted a massive stone wall guarded on all sides by statues. So we've got Moses here representing prophethood, uh, Aaron representing priesthood. We got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then we got the 12 apostles uh, up there on the top. It is a statement of authority, not a statement, not an invitation. But you'll notice it's not a picture of the king. The authority that the King James Bible was meant to invoke was not Queen Elizabeth or King Henry, but it was the ancient prophets and apostles. The King James Version's title included, contained the words appointed to be read in churches and that is what the translators had in mind. While most Geneva editions were small and portable and were printed in Roman type, by then the type familiar in most books and the same type we use today, the 1611 King James Bible was huge, 11 by 16 inches. Make sure you look at how big that is. Now, 11 by 16 inches is like this, 11 by 16, enormous book and it was very expensive, and it was printed in black letter type. Fortunately, the people's desire to possess the word of God prevailed, and the King James Version was soon printed in much more economical, marketable, and reader-friendly formats. It turned out to be a wise decision on the part of King James not to allow marginal notes with commentary on the text, a reaction, of course, to Geneva's copious notes. The idea was that in the absence of commentary, readers would need to turn to the church for explanations. But the decision actually had the opposite effect. Soon the greatest use of the Bible would be in private homes, not in churches, 
and the absence of commentary would free the reader to draw their own conclusions about scriptures with only the Holy Ghost for their guide. As the King James Bible was by design a revision of earlier translations out of many good ones, one principal one, its language was already dated when it was created. This was deliberate. In order to sound appropriate in public reading, remember it was uh, appointed to be read in churches, it was deliberately cast in a language more antiquated than, the, than that of common speech, a formal ritualized language that created an atmosphere of holiness. While the KJV provided a literal and faithful rendering of the Hebrew and Greek texts, it, in, it infused that translation with a sense of beauty and ceremony. And that is one of the reasons for its lasting power and appeal. Now, just a word about the printer, Robert Barker. You'll notice it says Robert Barker Printer. He was not just printer. He was printer to the king's most excellent majesty. And you can see that there's pretty big type there. Printer to the king's most excellent majesty. Printer to the king's most excellent majesty. And this very beautiful 1631 edition that we have here in Special Collections, Printer to the King's Most Excellent Majesty. Now, why is he important for this story? He's important for the following reason. Nobody owned, after the first edition was printed, nobody owned the King James Bible text. What that means is that every printer who printed it thereafter made changes in the text. These changes were in punctuation, spelling, italics, word forms, and a little bit in grammar. Robert Barker started the process with, his, with the second impression of the first edition in 1611, the 1613 edition, and on and on. The idea was to keep the language of the King James tra translation current with the changing English language. And this went on for about 150 years. Every so often, printers would make serious errors, as in this one to the Seventh Commandment. This, is, this infamous Bible cost Robert Barker an enormous fine from the crown. Ultimately, he was bankrupted as a result of this and um, lawsuits he had with various partners whom he was suing and being sued by simultaneously uh, this did not help his case one bit, nor was it likely an accident. Uh, my guess is that this was some disgruntled guy in the typesetting department who wasn't get paid, getting paid enough on his last day of work, decided to get even with his job, and it worked. The process of modernizing the text continued until, until Benjamin Blaney's edition in 1769. The 1769 edition of Benjamin Blaney, he was a Hebrew professor from Oxford University. His, his was an update of the language, spelling, punctuation, italics, and word forms. Um, by the time his was done and published, people decided to call it quits. So his edition of 1769 looks very much like ours today. And in fact, the church's edition published in 1979 is Benjamin Blaney's edition of the King James Bible from 1769. Now, some final thoughts. The King James Bible, when it was published, was not published with a great deal of acclaim. We don't know the publication date at all where there's no record of public notice when it came out. There's very little mention of the translation, even in the biographies, autobiographies, and reminiscences of the people, people who worked on it. it would, which means, at the time, they did not consider it a big deal. It was simply an assignment they received to make an update of the Bible and moved on with their lives. It was not well received by the public who liked the Geneva Bible very much. Finally, the king had to, had to um, ban the publication of the Geneva Bible so that the 1611 Bible could be sold in England. 
and eventually that led to the Geneva Bible going out of uh, print and out of use. But over the course of time, and it was a process that actually took centuries, uh, the King James Bible slowly became appreciated and then loved and then revered. And since then, it has had an enormous impact on the world. So today, as we celebrate the 400th birthday of the King James Bible, let us also celebrate the original authors, William Tyndale, the Geneva translators, and the King James translators for the contributions they made to bless our lives with the Bible in the English language. Thank you very much.